up yet. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Welcome back to the Idea Market Podcast. This is the founder, Mike Elias, and I'm here with Chase Palmieri, the founder and CEO of Creditor.com, the Rotten Tomatoes for News, which is a beautiful way of pitching in like two seconds, everything I've been trying to do for the last few years. So I'm looking forward to hearing a lot more about uh, your approach and philosophy and just the whole journey. Uh, welcome, man. I'm glad we can finally chat. Yeah, this is great. It's uh, It's been too long. We should uh, probably have done this years ago. So great to, great to connect. Yeah, man, absolutely would have, but uh, it, it took me forever to catch up. I've had my uh, <laughs> my blinders on for the last you know couple of years, I suppose. Um, yeah, I'd love to learn about, you know, what started you on this journey. And, you know, for me, it, it goes way, way back. So if you want to start when you're like five years old or something, please feel free. Uh, yeah, I mean, to some degree, the entrepreneurship bug goes way, way back. Um, the, uh, the media accountability bug, it was a little bit later, but both my parents are serial entrepreneurs. Um, my dad was owning and operating all, all kinds of different businesses, and I was helping out with him and my mom's businesses growing up. So he's, uh, he owns a restaurant that we built together. Um, he used to do import-export businesses. My mom is a corporate event producer, so the launch with Steve Jobs on the stage where he announced the iPad my mom was the producer for that event. So she does wow. those kinds of big corporate rollouts for new products for Google, eBay, Amazon, and Apple. Those are her four main clients. And she's still doing that today. And my dad's still running the restaurant and running other businesses as well. So both my parents, entrepreneurs, grew up being an entrepreneur, helping them with their businesses, went and got my degree in small business management and entrepreneurship, um, met who ended up being my co-founder there, uh, working on a project for what ended up being a, um, it wasn't a serious business at the time. It was just to enter our university's business concept competition, but it was a, a 3D printing software platform, basically an iTunes for 3D design files. Um, and we did well with that, bonded over that experience, went to compete against other schools. And then uh, after college, came back, ran the, the family restaurant for a few years while I was kind of thinking about what was the idea that I was willing to spend the next you know decade of my life working on. And, and at that same time, I was actually um, co-hosting the podcast and national radio show for Project Censored, which is a media watchdog, nonprofit, nonpartisan media watchdog here in Sonoma County. And uh, just really going deep on you know media reform, lack of media accountability, you know the issues that you and I are both very aware of around the financial incentives that are misaligned for readers today, with uh, the majority of news being consumed online and and supported by advertising. So uh, just really went deep with Project Censored there, and uh, eventually it just clicked for me one day. I'm I'm a hardcore Rotten Tomatoes kid, you know, big movie buff, and uh, I said wow, the solutions that we're hearing being proposed to combat the, the rising levels of clickbait and sensationalism and just low quality news is not adequate. It tends to be kind of this centralized approach. Oh, let's let Facebook and Twitter censor content on our behalf or, oh, let's let an out, you know, a government agency or a private company tell us which sources we should trust and just have that kind of be uh, fed to us downstream. And I thought, well, if the whole idea of us gathering news online now is that we're all online and that came with all these problems, that's what created the problems that, you know, most online media is supported by advertising. It also created the opportunity where we as news consumers could for the very first time connect and actually have more of a shared news gathering experience. And so um, just kind of went down that rabbit hole and realized that the reader empowerment model of a Rotten Tomatoes for news approach, or, or maybe a Yelp for news consumers. And I know that Yelp and Rotten Tomatoes, sometimes those come off different to different people who have their own experiences. But this, again, like you said, is just a, a three word way for us to quickly give uh, audiences a branch to hold on to to understand the concept, um, but that a Rotten Tomatoes for News was the ultimate solution because you can't actually solve for reader trust, which is at the heart of this issue, if you're telling them to just trust some 
you know, outside authority or expert. You have to let news consumers participate in the solution. And ultimately, the, the main thesis behind Credder is that digital, uh, that trust in the digital age is built in aggregate by being able to see transparently the feedback of your fellow consumers on a particular product or service. And that's why things like, you know, TripAdvisor, Yelp, Rotten Tomatoes, Trustpilot, all these different online review platforms have value is because we've, we've figured out that in the digital age, trust is built in aggregate. Yeah. Yeah. That makes perfect sense and aligns with everything that, you know, I've thought about idea market and these kinds of solutions as well. Um, that's awesome. So it sounds going back to, you know, the beginning of your story here, entrepreneurship is totally in your blood, been raised to do it. And, and that's super cool. Um, and, and very different for me. Um, I'm wondering, you said you're a big, uh, movie buff and Rotten Tomatoes fan. How, how exactly does Rotten Tomatoes work and how far do the parallels go in Credder? How close to that inspiration were you able to get? So uh, we, I would say we're very similar to Rotten Tomatoes also because the, uh, the founding CEO of Rotten Tomatoes, Patrick Lee, joined our team pretty early on in 2018. Uh, he was our first official advisor, you know, to basically the first non-founder to have equity in the company. He helped us go out and raise our angel round, put us in touch with all of his original co-founders from Rotten Tomatoes. So the Rotten Tomatoes DNA is pretty tightly interwoven into the Credder DNA. And that's why the methodology on the platform is very similar too. So uh, on Credder, again, similar to Rotten Tomatoes, there's both an audience score, which is open to the general public, and your more critic or professional score. So uh, for us, we call it the critic score. And those are articles, authors, and outlet scores that are reviewed by verified journalists. And then there's the public score, which again is open to anyone. And, and that, for example, is where I review articles under because I wouldn't uh, necessarily consider myself a journalist. Um, so the, uh, the difference between us and Rotten Tomatoes, and maybe Rotten Tomatoes will eventually do something uh, closer to what we're doing in this regard, but with Rotten Tomatoes, they're only rating movies. They're not rating you know, the director or the screenwriter or individual actors, for example, even though I think that that would be really interesting for them to do to, to kind of have aggregate scores that are maybe based on the, the accumulation of all of their movie scores. Um, but with Credder, Readers are reviewing individual articles. Um, right now, the limitation is English written content. Um, and when you review that article, our web crawler is able to uh, crawl the article for the byline to see which authors are uh, attributed to the article so that we can hold them accountable and bubble the ratings up to them, as well as the URL of the, the news website. And, and that receives its own kind of aggregate score. So with Credder, you have scores from critics and the public on the level of individual articles, authors, and outlets. And so uh, the goal here being able to allow readers to track the credibility over time for every article, author, and outlet in our news ecosystem. Awesome. The over time part of that, I'm really interested in how you think about it because a lot of the time it seems like articles are posted for a very specific moment and either they're completely overturned or uh, just people lose interest, you know, a short while later or a long while later. Uh, how, how do you approach that whole overtime aspect of this? Yeah, this is, uh, this is pretty crucial because news is, it, you know, it has a fixed time period of relevance, you know, sometimes 24 hours, sometimes only 48 hours, whereas a movie in the rotten, you know, keeping with the Rotten Tomatoes analogy, movies are kind of forever. Um, you could go check out a movie from the 1980s and still rate it on Rotten Tomatoes today. Um, but for us, it was important that you not be rating an author or an outlet, that you be rating a piece of content. So the truth is on Credit Today, until we reach a much larger level of scale, individual articles are not receiving huge amounts of reviews because there's an enormous amount of content. And again, this is the reason why something like what we're doing should exist, but there's yeah. so much content and it's, it's being pumped out so quickly, faster than ever, that individual articles aren't necessarily uh, always getting 
passing the threshold to receive their own article score. But the idea here is that every single review on an article does go towards the aggregate score for the author and the outlet. And we think it's a much better way of creating an author or an outlet score to have individual reviews spread across a larger sample size of content than for somebody to just come in and say, I don't like the New York Post. I'm going to rate the New York Post as two stars, for example. So uh, for us, it has to be based on the content. And then we also have this uh, very specific review process where, which we actually came up with working alongside media literacy experts, where a reader has to identify a very specific reason for their rating of that article. So for example, if I leave a five-star rating, I can select a specific positive feedback to tag to the URL of that article, such as it was investigative, or it was balanced, or well-sourced, or great context, uh, something specific to tag to the URL of that article. And then if something was wrong with the article, for some reason it lost the reader's trust, um, you can tag something as specific as a particular logical fallacy, uh, a particular type of bias, a particular mistake that you want to call out in the article. And so that's, uh, that's how we get a reader to be very specific and remove a lot of their own bias when reviewing the piece of content and force them to focus on the content, not the source. And then the, uh, the added layer of protection in there is that every review can then be voted on as helpful or not helpful by the rest of the community, kind of this stack overflow model, Quora type model where um, the best content gets upvoted, but we're also therefore creating accountability for the reviewers themselves because the reviewer rating, uh, which every reviewer has and is visibly displayed next to all of their reviews, that's the accumulation of their ratio of uh, positive helpful uh, votes to not helpful votes for their reviews across the entire site. Awesome, awesome. Um, I like how many kind of hoops you're asking public reviewers to jump through. And there's always this kind of struggle to like, yeah, you want to encourage people to um, be more careful and deliberate and considered with, you know, any of their interactions consuming news. And especially if you're rating it or, you know, contributing to whether or not other people are going to read it or trust it. And I'm wondering what's like, how do you get people to eat their vegetables? You know, there's yeah. so few people who really want to do that inherently. What's the, what, yeah. Yeah, it's a great point. Um, and it's something that, you know, maybe not all of our investors or maybe not everybody who wants to see us grow faster loves that there's this kind of you could call it artificial friction that we've introduced into the review process, because obviously if the rating was just a one to five star and you could just go around and rate the outlets directly, probably we'd get a lot more reviews, probably um, we'd have a lot more uh, activity, but I'm not sure that we'd have anything of real value at the end of the day. I'm not sure our database or our scores would be accurate. So for yeah. us, accuracy was what, um, was the goal. Um, so the truth is, and, and I've, I heard um, a recent over uh, interview on your podcast where the founder of over um, a stack overflow was on and, and he said the same point, which is that all of these review platforms and basically most, um, you know, consumer driven content platforms in general, it's about one to 5% of the users who are actually creating the content. And then the other 95 percent or so who are coming and, and gaining value from it or just referencing it for the information. And the same thing applies to us at Creditor. Uh, we have a community of hardcore news readers who are happy to spend the extra click to identify something specific about the article um, when they're leaving their review. And that creates a really great use case for that 95% who can come look at an article and instantly see before they read the article, oh, the author is saying that this has this particular type of bias that I should be on the lookout for, or there's this particular type of logical fallacy in the argument of the article. And as far as we know, we're the only place in the world today where you can actually kind of have that level of insight into a piece of content before you start reading it and, and actually yeah. use that to help determine whether or not the content is worth your time in the first place. Yeah, I totally like that. Um, you mentioned accuracy being the goal. 
how do you define or like iterate toward accuracy? Yeah, really uh, the way we think about this is that accuracy comes with greater scale and volume. Um, totally. Yeah. So that's really how we look at it. We, we, we feel really good about our review process. We've actually had many, many iterations to get to where it is today. And we feel really good about it. The goal of the review process was besides just getting really specific uh, kind of at a glance feedback for the next reader. Um, it was that somebody could come to our site for the very first time and know how to use it and not require a bunch of education. So that was the goal for that. But really on the other side of determining accuracy, um, I would say we think of it in two ways. The first, like I said, is the greater the volume, the greater confidence in a particular article author outlet score. And we actually display that too. We, we box and highlight certain scores uh, that you might be looking at to be like, this is the score that has the most significant volume of reviews behind it. So this is the score that we're the most confident in to provide for this piece of content or source. Um, and then the second is to some degree, Creditor's job isn't to decide whether things are accurate or not. We feel that we're really a, uh, an open and transparent tool for news consumers to voice their own feedback. So we really try to stay out of the process other than creating tools that um, the community finds valuable. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes perfect sense, especially if you're, you're confident in the process that people are going through and that articles are subjected to, then it does make sense that like, with more uh, scale and activity in general, the signal would be clearer, like it would emerge from a greater diversity of inputs. Yeah, well, one of the other pieces of that puzzle is that when you look at other players in, um, in our space, they tend to be, you know, we can talk about the difference between our decentralized kind of crowdsourced approach versus their kind of centralized gatekeeper, you know, um, um, ministry of truth, if you will, type approach. But uh, one of the benefits of a creditor is that our data, our, the accuracy of the reviews is literally improving every single day because we're not just putting a score out once a year. It is a dynamically updating database. So every day, uh, and by the way, if you had an issue with an outlet rating, for example, and you don't think it's accurate, and there's maybe not that many reviews, then get in there and start reviewing content. And that outlet rating is going to start to change over time. And, and it's an open kind of live discussion on the accuracy of each article, author, and outlet. So the dynamic aspect where each day, each review is making it more accurate, we think also provides an advantage uh, to our model. Yeah, that makes sense. I like the cumulative general structure of this. And you, you can also see that in the way that you're not having people directly review authors or uh, institutions, but having those all be downstream from reviews, if I understand correctly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's super cool. Um, I'm wondering what the, like who, who, who gets to post or like whose, whose articles get to appear for critique on, on Creditor and are there criteria for that? Do they evolve? Is there a, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in your, your general overview. Yeah, so it is as open as it can get, meaning anybody can create an account and start submitting whatever articles they want. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the rest of the community is going to engage with it, um, but anybody can create an account, anybody can post articles to the platform for review, and they could post an article and then review it themselves, um, or they can post it and, and try to wait and see what other readers think about it. Um, one of the ways that the articles hit the homepage, which is kind of maybe more relevant, is that when an article gets a review, as soon as it gets one review, it hits the homepage. And if it starts to get more reviews from uh, readers, it will stay on the homepage longer. If not, it will start to fall down the homepage. Um, like so, so if an article doesn't have a review, it doesn't get put on the homepage because our concept here is if you, let's take an example, if you um, took a, an article you really hated it, but maybe it doesn't deserve to be hated on as much. You review it with your negative review, it hits the homepage. Now we're basically forcing 
you to not be reviewing that article in a silo. You know, now we're saying, okay, boom, this person reviewed it. Now we're going to try to get other people to review it as well to make sure that there's kind of a, a balance and a significant sample size on that article. I think that's really cool. I like that idea of everyone, as soon as, as soon as someone cares enough to review one thing, it's put before everyone to see if it's worth staying relevant. I think that, that's, a, exactly. that's a really novel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Idea Market was very much inspired by Reddit, and that is decidedly not the way they do things. So yeah. I, I like hearing this new, new spin on that. Yeah, because it would be bad if you could just keep posting 300 articles from one source and keep reviewing it negatively, and nobody else is even seeing that you're kind of uh, pulling down an outlet rating or an author's rating. So it forces other people to get involved if you're, if you're doing something like that. That's a good point. I like that a lot. So you mentioned like anyone can sign up and post articles. Does that mean that, you know, Substack writers can get reviewed and, and things like that too? The, okay, so this is a really big part of the thesis as well here is that it is ridiculous that in, you know, 2022, we still look at brands, you know, Vice, Fox, as opposed to the brand reputation of individual writers. Um, and it is because of Credder's ability to create a separate author score that we're able to create these reputations and brands for the individual writers. Uh, so yeah, us, what we do is um, if if a Substack writer has their ch you know their channel, um, they're being reviewed uh, separately and their author score on the byline. If their name is on a byline, we find it and we're attributing the reviews to them. And we think that this is. Um, really powerful, especially in an age where individual writers are trying to carry their audience or their reputation with them to a Substack or a ghost or, or somewhere else, um, even a medium blogger. You know, the idea here is that the writer should own their reputation. And yeah, if you're building brand trust for the brand, first off, now we can quantify that um, for the publishers like, hey, every outlet page has a list of authors that are associated with that publication. And you can see right there who is gaining or losing trust in that brand for you. Um, so we actually think that this will ultimately become a kind of a hiring uh, uh, a tool as well for publishers who are looking for kind of uh, underappreciated but highly trusted talent. Um, and maybe, you know, a, a check on some staff writers who aren't necessarily building brand trust the way they should be. Um, so yeah, for us, it's a big part of the thesis that the outlet, this outlet model where you look to the brand won't last forever. I, I mean, maybe it will exist forever, but the, the direction, the trend is really writers and individuals taking control of their audience and taking control of their own reputations. And we think Credder is a great way to empower individual writers to take that leap if they want to leave you know, their outlet and, the, and all the value that comes with that and say, hey, I'm on Substack now. And by the way, um, you should subscribe because you know if you look at my creditor score i'm you know in the top five top rated authors on credit for example sweet so it seems like you could also use credit to build a substack reputation too absolutely yeah yeah you'd be building uh you know on substack i think you have your own name for your channel right yeah. um right so I, I think platformer is one of the popular ones with Casey Newton, right? Um, so platformer is getting a rating, but so is Casey Newton. Gotcha. Okay, because platform is the brand that he can let other authors write under and things like that. Right, because we do the author. Yeah. Right, because we do it by URL for the outlet. So it's like platformer.substack.com or something like that. So we have an individual. Uh, we have a different URL, so we can attribute the reviews differently to platformer versus just Substack as an aggregate. Sweet, awesome. Um, I just have a, a couple more like technical questions as to how things work, and then sure. we can riff a bit more. Um, the critics, like, how do you become a critic? How do you become like verified as a critic on Credit? Yeah, so there's really two ways to do this. Um, we, for the majority of the critics that are approved on our platform, we basically outsource 
the verification method method to Twitter. So uh, Twitter has kind of this uh, pretty extensive, from what I from what we understand, um, path to verifying yourself if you're a journalist on Twitter. And a lot of journalists are verified with that blue check mark on Twitter. So what we do is we when we can, we say, okay, if you're verified on Twitter, let DM us, DM Creditors Twitter, and we'll uh, tell us what your you know username is on Creditor, and we'll go in and we'll verify you as a critic journalist. Uh, basically, saying if you're verified by Twitter, that's good enough for us. Um, the other way we do this, if for example somebody's not verified on Twitter or they don't want to be on Twitter, don't have an account, um, we do have a more lengthy process where they'd have to send us. Uh, three different articles that they produced under an outlet uh, that month, uh, because one of the requirements is that you have to be an active journalist. You can't just be somebody who was a journalist and now uh, is just kind of going around critiquing things. You need to actively pr be producing content yourself. Gotcha. And can Substack authors count? Like if someone simultaneously has a Substack and a Twitter verification? Yeah, absolutely. The only limitation is you can't review your own content. That makes sense. Yeah. Cool. All right, right on. That makes sense. I like that idea of sort of, you know, being able to outsource that whole vetting process. <laughs> we like that too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that allows um, the team to stay small. Yeah. Gotcha. Cool. No, that that's fantastic. Are there any, I mean, let me know if this is an industry secret, but are there any other ways that you're, you know, taking advantage of existing infrastructure and, and throwing it together in new ways? Definitely. So part of the Rotten Tomatoes playbook here, um, I don't know if you know this, most people don't, um, but you couldn't actually leave a review on RottenTomatoes.com for I think the first five years of Rotten Tomatoes existence. Um, and that might seem really strange to people because they're like, wait, it's a review platform. How are they getting the critic reviews then? Um, but the way that it actually worked is there were people behind the scenes at Rotten Tomatoes who were going to like Roger and Ebert blog site. Um, and they just had a list of critic, uh, movie critic blog sites, they would go look at them. And whenever they saw a review on a movie, they would basically just copy and paste it onto their platform. They were manually aggregating the critic reviews onto the platform. And that was how they bootstrapped the scores for the first five years. Uh, because obviously, when you're young, growing, not, you know, a big player in the space, why, why should Roger, uh, you know, come spend his time to leave a review on your platform. He's got his own site to promote. So that was a really interesting thing that Rotten Tomatoes did. They basically just wanted to be the, the aggregate of all of these different movie critic blog sites that were separate and, and, uh, and that worked for them. And so what we did is we tried to find a similar kind of, uh, if you want to call it a hack, fine. Uh, we kind of refer to it as a hack. And so what we do is, again, using Twitter and using Twitter's verified journalists with the blue check mark, um, we've created a tool, we call it our Twitter curator app, um, where if a verified journalist on Twitter tweets and we see that there's an article URL within the tweet, it gets pulled into our internal dashboard. Um, then we have somebody manually on the team looking through these tweets. And if journalist Joe Schmo tweeted something really positive about an article, we would in one click um, add that uh, critic review to the critic score for that article, create, simultaneously creating the article page and adding the critic review and adding it as a positive uh, star rated review to that article. Again, without the journalists needing to be part of it and with everything transparently there because the review is the embedded tweet itself. So you can always just click on that tweet to be sent to the exact spot where that tweet existed. And because tweets are public domain, this is a really interesting way for us to scale the database, uh, especially of critic scores, because we were doing great with the public scores, but for a while it was really difficult to get a journalist who's very busy, um, has their own you know, schedule, creates content you know, to, for money um, to come and spend their time on credit.com reviewing articles. And so we found this to be a great way to basically bootstrap the critic score while our uh, you know, diehard news consumers are doing what they're doing on credit.com for the public score. Gotcha. Do you ever have, um, do you have people who are experts in a field 
like email you and say, you know, this is wrong, but I'm not a journalist, so I have no power here. Uh, Anything like that? Not much, not really. Um, they do have power because the public review ability is right there for them. So they could create an gotcha. account and leave the review. It just wouldn't go to the, towards the critic score. But gotcha. uh, honestly, I think most people are referencing the public score uh, these days too. It, similar to Rotten Tomatoes, you know, when you go to Rotten Tomatoes, some people might lean more heavily towards a critic score, but there's big differences on Rotten Tomatoes. You know, when you have like an indie film, for example, sometimes the critics go nuts for it, but the audience just didn't get it or understand the movie. And so it gets poorly rated. And then you have like Marvel movies where they get huge audience scores, but the critics are like, this was a terrible movie. Why? Like, so, so there's really big differences sometimes in the critic and audience score on Rotten Tomatoes. And so it forces the user to kind of decide which uh, which score they tend to align with more. And the same thing applies to Credit. I think some readers are like, no, I'm, I'm more aligned with the established journalist ratings. And I like to, you know, go by those and others go by the, the more public score. Have you seen any interesting patterns there? Like there's, it feels to me like there's a growing schism between journalists as a group and the public as a group. How are you, how is that is that showing up at all? Are you seeing things? It is definitely showing up. Um, yeah, it, like I said, the the big gaps that you see in movies, we're seeing those now because they're being measured now. Uh, we're seeing those in traditional mainstream outlets. So, you know, the New York Times, the Atlantic, all you know, um, Washington Post. These these big name brands, they're still getting really positively reviewed by journalists who are kind of in the club, but the public. You know, and, and this shows in all polling over the last basically the last decade with news consumers at record levels of distrust in, in mainstream media, the public is, you know, bringing these outlets in in like the 65 to 70 percent range, whereas the critics still have them up in the high 90s. And it shows you that, um, you know, maybe the journalist critic score, and this is why we wanted to make sure that they were separate. Um, the journalists sometimes are of a certain type of bias themselves or political leaning. And so maybe they're not as alert to uh, a framing of an article being presented with that political leaning because to them, it's just obvious. Whereas the, the public is like, stop giving me, you know, stop mixing your opinion in with, with the news of the day, just give me the information. And so what we see is that the, the articles, authors and outlets that are the most straightforward, meaning like, the author is almost nowhere to be found in the piece of content. It's just like, here's what happened on this day and time, and then this happened, and here's the sourcing, and here's the additional evidence to support that this happened here at this date and time. Um, those articles, authors, and outlets, you can't really review them negatively because all they're doing is presenting the information accurately and in a well-sourced way without any political agenda or leaning. And so those end up getting nothing but positive reviews. And that's really the point of Credit is um, we want the most straightforward news without the political leaning to be the stuff that rises to the top. And so uh, people often come to us and they say, well, aren't you going to have a, a left-wing you know, reader reviewing Fox negatively or, uh, you know, a right wing reader reviewing CNN negatively. And it's like, well, if CNN is presenting the news from a left leaning bias, then yes, the person on the right is going to call that out and vice versa. And that's as it should be, because the idea here is that on Credit, the stuff that really gets the best scores is the stuff that both sides could agree is is well reported news. Yeah, I like that a lot, especially that, you know, as that grows and as as creditors impact means more for journalists and for the public, it becomes clearer that winning means bringing these two sides together. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the other piece here is that um, and we see this a lot where a journalist writes a great story, but then it gets handed off to the editor to write the headline. And you get this terrible clickbait, you know, BS headline uh, attached to an otherwise really great investigative, well-researched story. And what we're trying to do is create an incentive for the journalist to basically say, hey, editor, no, 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 no. You don't get to write my headline because I'm getting reviewed negatively on Credit for this clickbaited headline when otherwise my content is good. 
And my score, my individual author score, which matters to me, is taking a hit every time you write my headline. And so we're trying to really create a, uh, a pre-publication check on the, uh, on the publisher, on the editor, and on the individual journalist to basically say, is this article, is me putting this article out worth the clicks and the advertiser revenue? that it's going to negatively, is it worth it compared to the negative, you know, 10% hit I might get on my creditor score, uh, that's going to be really hard to bring back up again. And so we're really trying to create this, you know, pre publication uh, thought process where they go, yeah, maybe this piece of content, maybe I don't need to put this out, you know, it's not worth, not worth getting, you know, the negative percentage decline on my creditor score. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, going back to tracking, you know, reputation over time at the article level, if if something is uh, you know big and relevant for a while and gets a high rating, and then some reasonable amount of time, six months, a year passes, and the conclusions presented in that are completely overturned, is there a retroactive? loop does that show up in any way or does history just kind of stick the new thing onto the old thing and like I'm, I'm what's your you know approach for that yeah so our approach there is just that every time an article page is created on creditor it's forever so if we find out later that an article um you know was was totally manipulated or lied uh, about by the journalist or, or for whatever reason, something was totally wrong about the article that was passed off as okay originally. Um, it's, it's up to readers whether they want to go back, click on that article and start to review it negatively or edit their review to more accurately reflect the score as they understand it now. Um, so if you had already reviewed it positively, you can edit your review to, to reflect your, your you know, most recent opinion of that article. And if that article blows up and goes, you know, gets popular, because all of a sudden people realize that it was, uh, it was BS and, and passed off as news at the time, the bigger that outrage is, the more people that are going to go back and find that article on creditor and set things right. That makes sense. Okay, cool. So there it is, you know, and there's sort of an outrage driven feedback loop that if yeah, if we don't yeah. see that much. Um, you know, there, there's obviously been some high profile cases. I think there was the New York Times journalist uh, last year who was found out to be, um, you know, just making up some stories. And then there's obviously some bigger articles like uh, some of the the stories that kind of pushed us into the war in Iraq around WMDs and and kind of that misreported um you know, for for bad intended reasons, or maybe they were just stenographers to to the power of the time, uh, that were totally inaccurate and not evidence based. Those articles ex exist, and if anybody wants to go hold those authors and outlets accountable, they can do that because everything on Credit is forever transparently visible, open, um, and accessible to all. Gotcha. That makes sense. Um... Yeah, I mean, I can imagine why that'd be really challenging because these, these kinds of misdirections and, and misapplications of journalistic power don't tend to happen at the individual article granularity. Like there may be one that represents, uh, you know, goading people into the war in Iraq, but that was probably done through hundreds or thousands of articles over a period of time. And yeah. the outrage can't be spread so thin. But it does tend to either bubble up to an individual author or an individual outlet that was pushing that. Um, and, and that's why we think, you know, the author score especially is important. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Um, I wanted to ask about your time at Project Censored because I think I've heard, I've heard of it. I've encountered it in various places. And yeah. with a name that provocative, I mean, you must be going through all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, Wondering what's the craziest thing you found or found out or discovered or, you know, what, what blew your mind at Project Censored? What kinds of things, you know, crossed your desk? Oh, geez. Um, well, first off, every year Project Censored puts out a new book 
and it's the 25 most censored stories of the year. So that maybe the book. I've seen that. Yeah, I've so, almost bought that book four or five times. <laughs> you should you should buy it. You should support them. If not, I'll, I can always give you some copies. I got a bookshelf full of them here. But um, yeah, every year uh, Project Censored puts out the 25 most underreported or censored stories of the year, and and these tend to be really meaningful, like world impacting stories that just nobody heard about. Um, and that's that's kind of the uh, the main product that Project Censored puts out. Um, yeah. I was the co-host uh, and I, I did have some sections in the books, but um, I was uh, the co-host of the Project Censored podcast and national radio show. Um, and so every every week uh, we would put out a new episode and we would basically have on individual journalists who put out a really important story that was just purposefully being underreported by mainstream press um, and discussing topics like, for example, nuclear energy and how, um, how, you know, basically issues around propaganda and how things like, you know, um, how government propaganda, how kind of we've, uh, things around self-censorship in the digital age, um, you know, things about certain movements, like for example, the environmental movement being very anti-nuclear energy, even though, um, you know, facts and, and the science seem to suggest that it's one of the most beneficial and safe forms of energy, but the association between nuclear energy and nuclear, you know, nuclear missiles and bombs that, so we really go into the deep discussions on um, basically how information reaches society and where that goes wrong at times. And, uh, and that's obviously where the itch for Credder started to really, uh, you know, come to be. Totally. What, was there a particular tipping point when you got mad enough to start Credder or start thinking about it? Uh, so while I was doing Credder, definitely I was getting madder and madder. I, I will say that, um, and I kind of have always said that this company was born out of my very real personal frustration with the uh, kind of what I feel is a downward spiral, uh, a race to the bottom for the quality of news. And I can get into why that is. It basically is that uh, if news is built around clicks and attention to satisfy the advertising partners, and if that's the main revenue model, then the news has to be more and more sensational and clickbaity um, and attention grabbing than the next publisher. And the next publisher who is also fighting for that advertising dollars has to make it even more and more sensational. And so what you have is an incentive structure that is not aligned with readers and is basically just aligned with advertisers. And so it does create this downward spiral. And so for me, when we started you know, thinking about this back all the way back in 2016 and start kind of working on some early prototypes, um, it was very obvious to me that terms like fake news, misinformation, clickbait, and, and this, kind of, um, this kind of broader mainstream understanding of the problem was, was going to be made clear. But at the time in 2016, people still didn't think there was a problem. And, uh, but the problem structurally already existed and it was very obvious what the trend was gonna be, which is this race to the bottom. And so uh, that frustrated me. I didn't see anybody talking about empowering news consumers to hold media accountable uh, or rate the news or Rotten Tomatoes for news. You know, when we first thought of the idea, my co-founders and I, we spent the first three and a half weeks to a month just doing deep research, all of us, on if somebody was already talking about this, if it was built, um, if there's anything like it. And when we didn't see anybody doing anything about it or talking about it, we felt like, you know, if not us, then who? Um, and uh, and it seemed like we had a pretty good head start on the space because we knew the problem was going to get worse and worse. But we, you know, it wasn't obvious to everyone yet. So there wasn't a bunch of companies trying to jump in and solve the problem yet. Um, but definitely, my frustration was getting bigger and bigger. That's why I joined the Project Censored team in the first place. Um, and when we started Credder, I was still co-hosting that program for the first few years. It, was, it wasn't until um, I started my own podcast, the Credder podcast, that I really started to kind of have to 
uh, I just didn't have the time to be doing credit of the company, credit of the podcast and the Project Censored show. So uh, I haven't been on Project Censored in a while, but uh, every now and then I jump on for an episode. Cool. I'm just curious, what, how, what was like the format of the Project Censored podcast? Was there a particular angle or attitude or, yeah, I'm just curious how that, how that runs. Uh, it was kind of an interview based uh, show. There was a lot less of me and my co-host Mickey Huff um, sharing our own opinions. It was more, you know, question based, let, let an expert uh, guest speak to a specific issue. Um, and because it was radio, we had to throw on the, uh, yeah, we'll be right back after this musical or commercial break kind of thing. And, and so there's a little bit of that kind of uh, having to cut off a guest half, you know, rant to be like, and eh, we'll be back in five. So that was kind of annoying. And, and I didn't love that aspect of it. Um, and we had this fixed amount of time where we had to fill the half hour, but you couldn't go over a half hour. Um, so that I didn't love either, because sometimes you're just getting into the juicy stuff and you have to turn it off. Or sometimes maybe you're, you know, it's not really working with a guest, but you still have to fill the last 10 minutes. Um, so I didn't love that that piece of it, but um, it was basically a question and answer show where we'd have on guests and journalists and professors and and people who were saying some pretty bold things, you know, people who weren't necessarily uh, free to share their thoughts. The, the whole idea of Project Censored is that we're not afraid of words, um, and we kind of believe that sunlight is the ultimate disinfectant like it, if somebody's got a bad idea the best way to combat that is being able to also hear somebody with a better idea and hearing both of them and ideally the audience being able to see both of them you know hash out that argument and uh, and understand where one person's argument falls apart and where the others uh, takes the win 100 percent, 100 percent. i love that and that kind of ties into something else i wanted to ask which is about you know, how everyone, you know, working on this problem in some form falls somewhere on the uh, censorship versus not censorship kind of yeah. spectrum. <laughs> and I'm wondering, like, how do you resolve that? Where, where are you? Yeah, um, this, I think, is has always been kind of maybe um, the the only area where my co-founder and I kind of tend to disagree. Uh, I am a lot further on the free speech spectrum. Um, whereas I think, uh, I think he would say that, you know, healthy content moderation is important and has value. And, and obviously to some extent, I agree. Um, we were, we thought about this from the early days because obviously I was already working at Project Censored before we started Credder. So the, the idea of censorship and online censorship was um, very ingrained. And so, what we, the, another reason that we had reviewers review individual pieces of content is that it becomes really hard for the reviewer to uh, spew a bunch of crazy nonsense because their goal with the review, the content that they're posting onto the platform is a critique of an article, uh, basically saying what, whether or not the journalistic reporting of a piece of content was done well or not. And so it's less of a comment section where people are sharing their own thoughts and ideas and this kind of, you know, forum style where the conversation can devolve into anything. And, uh, and it's more about a specific critique on a piece of content. And so that was helpful because the only types of reviews that we would ever pull down, and we have had to do this every once in a while, are basically pure spam where somebody's just, you know, throwing out a Bitcoin, you know, wallet address or something like that. Um, and it's not even a review. They're just trying to spam uh, the platform or um, times when the person doesn't actually review the article and is just saying what they think about other things, but there is no critique of the article. So for example, if a user says, you know, this article was not accurately reported, it didn't, it didn't, give you the full concept context on this issue. It omitted a lot of uh, important kind of relevant information about this issue. And then the user says, and my personal opinion is blah, 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 blah. Great, go for it, you know? But the point of the review is to critique somebody else's piece of content. It's not for you to be, you know, creating your own piece of content in that, in that spot. 
Um, so the only times we've had to remove people's comments is uh, if they're not even trying to review the article. If you're not trying to review the article, then yeah, that'll come down. Sure, that makes sense. It's all you know a format kind of distinction as opposed to a content yeah. kind of distinction. Yeah, and the format really forces a certain um, piece of content out of the user. And if not, it's very obvious to see that they weren't following, you know, the guidelines of the purpose of what a review is. Yeah, totally. Um, another another relevant spectrum for our niche is the sort of establishment versus crackpot spectrum. I'm very much on the crackpot side. I'm just, I don't know, I'll, I'll go about, on about that forever. But uh, your, you know, creditor has, has really kind of taken a stand with journalists and giving them the critic role, giving them the special uh, powers uh, in a certain respect. And I'm wondering if you can help restore my faith in, in journalists in, in general and like where, where is your hope coming from? Uh, okay, so I, in some ways, the critic category has a little bit more esteem on the platform, a little bit of VIP treatment, but at the same time, it doesn't. It's just two scores. And for people who, you know, many of our readers have totally lost faith in the established journalist class. So they don't give a crap what the, the critics think about an article. They want to see what the, the public thinks because yeah. they, they think that the public has the real nose for BS nowadays, which by the way, I, I do think um, readers have developed online a lot better, this kind of nose for BS. Um, as for hope, uh, there, there are a lot and of- I didn't mean to lead the witness either. Like, tell me how you feel. I, I, yeah, yeah. Well, no, there are some things that make me really nervous. Um, the embracing of centralized authorities who tell us what to trust and what not to trust, but do not allow readers to participate or voice their feedback. Um, and, and unfortunately in our space, uh, as, for, as for our revenue model where we, uh, and we can get into this, but Credder sells uh, it, its database of content author and outlet scores to other content platforms to help them optimize and prioritize credible content and sources within their own products or for advertisers to target uh, credible content and sources with their ad placements uh, for a better performance. There are other players in our space, you know, doing something very similar. And it's a little disheartening to see how much a, uh, how much, I guess I'll name them, NewsGuard is embraced uh, by other businesses and by the, uh, even news readers, because what they're really doing is it's just a group of people going around slapping a green, yellow, red label on an outlet with no like inside look into how they came up with that and no allowing readers to participate and no dynamic way of it updating over time. Um, and so we're really disheartened in how much um, people seem to be adopting these ministry of truth type uh, private corporations or government agencies. Um, the hope that, that we also feel though is that at the same time, as people have figured out this kind of, and people like Donald Trump have popularized the term fake news, this concept has hit mainstream now. People are more aware than ever that there's a problem, that there's kind of a, a rot at the core of you know, what's going on in journalism today and the incentives are broken. And they're looking for solutions. I think that they're unfortunately being a little bit lazy and landing on these centralized uh, you know, trust raters as the solution. But I think the next wave is going to be them going, oh, whoa, 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 no, we can't outsource our critical thinking to some, you know, body of journalists. We have to have a way of, of decentralizing reputation. Um, and so my hope is that the next wave lands people where we've kind of always figured that the long tail was going to end up. Eventually, people are going to want to be able to review the news themselves and just see what other readers think about content and sources. Um, besides that, my hope is that Creditor's, uh, Creditor has an API where we can display Creditor scores next to content and sources on other people's products and services. And the good thing about people who start social media platforms 
Um, and this is a big chunk of our customer base, people who, uh, who run news aggregators and social media platforms. They are not centralized thinkers. They're very decentralized, crowdsource friendly, uh, consumer friendly types of platforms. And so they don't look to these establishment players. They look to something like Credder to display scores next to content on their platforms. And so we're getting a lot of adoption and integrations going there where creditors, third party crowdsource scores are showing up on social media sites and news aggregators. And, uh, and these other guys are not being taken seriously at all. And at the end of the day, you have to go where news consumers are. And that's primarily social media and news aggregator sites. So if, if readers are seeing creditor scores um, and eventually even being able to rate content uh, through these other platforms, then uh, we feel really hopeful because it's a really hard sell for someone like NewsGuard to go to a Facebook and say, hey, we're just this small group of people who decide ratings. Will you put it on your platform next to all of your content? Facebook's going to have a hard time pushing that on their users because they're such a consumer friendly, you know, consumer engagement type of platform. They're much more willing to put on a score that is dynamic and allows their own users to go participate in it so that Facebook or any other social media platform can say, hey, if you don't like the scores for Fox News, it's an open, free, accessible platform. Just just go on to credit.com and review articles from that outlet yourself and it will affect the way the ratings are showing up on our platform so it's like hands off for us creditors hands off this is an open tool it's almost like a protocol yeah yeah that's awesome have you had um i mean you clearly must have, have had some luck with that with that pitch i really like the way it kind of takes the responsibility off of the platform itself and says here yeah this is this has been the, we want to really break into more of the digital advertising world um, soon. But the the our our early customer base is mostly social media platforms and news aggregators, uh, and the pitch is 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 basically what I just said. But it's also a little bit uh, around you know why take these editorial decisions into your own hands? It's just going to backfire. Yeah. Um, it's just going to make you look like you're censoring content. Uh, you're, there's no way your content review teams are going to be able to keep up to date on who the best publishers writing about X topic are. Uh, you know, all there's new publishers and authors popping up every day. You don't want to just stick to showing mainstream sources in your newsfeed because we all know that news consumers have record levels of distrust in mainstream sources. So you need to find a more kind of diverse set of publishers to feature uh, in your algorithms or on your in your news related products and creditor can be helpful in identifying those underrated uh, highly rated but underrated uh, sources that you can show and also around section 230 risk like if you uh, there's a little bit of uh, liability risk there if you start to um, censor content uh, so yeah Anyway, there's a lot of reasons why the social media players are, are really responsive to this, um, but it's the next challenge for Credder is going to be to get digital advertisers to see value from a brand safety and higher performance standpoint in targeting their ads, not just to mainstream news sources and not touching any of the long tail content and, and publishers and not necessarily just putting it everywhere either, uh, because they can sometimes be putting their brand at risk for showing up on a kind of a risky or low quality publisher or author's piece of content. So uh, the database is really useful in anyone dealing with content online today. Awesome. Yeah, I really like that. Just the general approach of adding a new filter that then other platforms and other people can use to to curate without any extra effort it's, on their part. It's just a new signal that hasn't existed before. We're basically just measuring people's trust in content and sources. And uh, it's a signal that uh, nobody should be afraid to feature on their platform because it's, again, it's just what your own users think. Gotcha. Um, Referring to like the general trend of clickbait driving attention and, and basically the model devolving into sensationalism. Um, one of my favorite Twitter accounts is Eric Weinstein. Yeah. And uh, I'd like an, an objection that he brings up to that whenever certain topics come up. Uh, Jeffrey Epstein 
UFOs, etc. Uh, he says, and I agree, these are these are fascinating topics, sensational as hell. Yeah, and yet they don't get covered. Yeah. Um, why? And 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 what you know? Just what what reactions does that create in you? How do you feel about that, in general? Um. So I'll, again, not speaking on behalf of Creditor here, I'll just, I'll say. Oh, yeah, you know, no, by I'll, all means, I'll, yeah. to, I'll blur out your logo. Yeah, no, 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 just, no, 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 but, no, but just to like, uh, everything I've said till now is kind of on behalf of Creditor, but if we want to go down these gotcha. rabbit holes a little bit, I'll just distinguish yeah, that these are my thoughts, uh, not necessarily the thoughts of Creditor, uh, because True. again, Creditor is supposed to not have an opinion on anything, um, even though some of us individually do. Uh, sure. Just outright on those two topics, I don't believe Jeffrey Epstein killed himself, and I do believe that the uh, the UFO uh, or or UAP phenomenon is real. Um, has more than enough evidence to support its its uh, that it's really happening, and um, and I personally I like the folks who are treating it like a national security issue uh, because it seems to be the only way to get it the coverage that it deserves because. Um, when you're talking about threats of national security, now everybody that takes themselves seriously has to take this seriously. And, uh, and I think that that's been a breakthrough in why we've been seeing a lot more of the coverage uh, lately, even though it's definitely still massively underreported. And so your question is kind of to, these are incredibly sensational topics, get a ton of engagement. There's whole communities around them, but journalists don't touch them. And it's a, it's a really good question. I think there's a couple things going on. First is I think journalists are, uh, as much as they throw out a lot of clickbait these days, I think that these topics have such a stigma of uh, that they don't want it to negatively affect their reputation. And I unfortunately, this kind of stere this uh, stereotype or label of conspiracy theorist has been is so strong um, that journalists don't they'll do anything to stay away from that label uh, just because of the career risk um, because they're not going to get fired for talking about the next you know cultural hot topic but they 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 see it as career risk to cover certain topics. Um, and I also think that to some degree, the, the outlets might not want us talking about this. Uh, I, I do think that there is so much interplay between the US government and US mainstream media right now, that if you think of uh, the UAP UFO phenomenon in, per phenomenon in particular, it ha there has been, whether you believe it's true or not, there has definitely been a serious effort to suppress information on the topic. And where is that suppression coming from? Primarily from the US government who either has active programs on it, or if you wanna, if you say uh, that the active programs that they used to have no longer exist because there was nothing there and it was just experimental, fine. Either way, there is suppression of information on these topics. Um, and I think some people might say, well, that's, that's good. I think the government should suppress the topics because we'd have all out chaos if the world actually knew, if these things existed and the world actually knew. Um, I'm not sure I agree with that. I actually think that this is a moment of coming together for the world. If we can, uh, if we can embrace and try to, try to really embrace that these things are real, which to me, it's, it's still really... It's still really fantastical, but uh, I do look to evidence and I do think there's sufficient evidence in this space. But, but ultimately, I think the government, um, just like when there's a whistleblower like Edward Snowden or something like that, they try to suppress the publisher from putting out that information. And sometimes uh, they do so with the threat of lawsuits and nobody, no publisher wants to go up against the U.S. government for, you know, uh, things around the Espionage Act or treason or, or any of these kinds of really hefty, serious um, lawsuits that come about when you, you try to disclose classified information or, or information that puts national security at risk, which, you know, these definitions have become more and more vague as to what you can actually share. 
So I do think that the government is tied in pretty deep with mainstream media and that uh, the government basically says, hey, if you want continued access to you know, our representatives if for quotes and comments and interviews, then we need you to play ball to a certain degree. And this is a topic that we just don't want to see you cover. Access. Yeah. Ultimately, I think it comes down to access because that's what the publishers have to lose. If you cover, if you, if you're, you know, at the White House briefing room and you ask a really challenging question to uh, to who, whatever representative is on stage, or say it's the, you know, the United States president, there's a chance that you're not going to be able to interview those folks because they keep a list. You know, they know, hey, this guy was a little combative. You know, this guy's not really framing it in a way where he makes Democrats look good right now. Or, you know, this guy's a little too challenging. You start to lose access. And, and when other journalists get to have the high profile interviews with the Secretary of Defense or, you know, who, you know, whoever's in charge at the Pentagon or whatever, and you no longer have that because of one question where you asked, was that question really worth it? Like, was asking that one question really worth it for your career to no longer have access to all the intelligence uh, professionals or, or insiders inside the White House or other, you know, really powerful positions? So there's just too much career risk. Um, and I think a lot of a lot of journalists today are are scared because, you know, publishers are going under, they're losing revenue. There's, there's a lot of loss of jobs in these spaces and the future is incredibly unclear. And I think that, uh, that a lot of them are really just trying to keep their heads down and make the publisher and the pub, therefore the publishers advertisers happy and just not wrinkle too many feathers to make sure that they can still put food on the table for their family. And, and ultimately, unfortunately, the incentives always drive home to the individual. Like, can I put food on my, on the table for my family? Yeah, totally. I think, you know, that drives with a lot of things that I've heard from other people too, that makes uh, perfect sense that, you know, these industries and the people in them are in a bind and ultimately, yes, there's that, you know, uh, that, that leverage uh, that people have stacked against them, um, that it becomes so incredibly costly to, as you say, ask the one crazy question. Yeah. And then, and then maybe, yeah, your and it's not has to, yeah. It's not like they're going to answer that challenging question you ask either. So like from their standpoint, they're like, I can ask this really tough question. Like I think a recently a journalist asked Pelosi about, um, you know, insider trading. It's like yeah. she's not going to answer that question. And now you're never going to have access to Pelosi or her staff again. You're probably blacklisted to a lot of events and other, uh, you know, Democratic officials that you might want to ask for interview on totally unrelated um uh, topics, you're just blacklisted. And what did you really get out of it? You got to ask the question, but there's no way you're going to get the answer. So if you're that person, it's really hard to, to make the stand. You've, you've worked 25 years to get into the White House briefing room and, and be in front of these people. And then you're going you're gonna to throw it away for a question that you know isn't going to get answered. It's tough. Yeah. Yeah. The cost benefit analysis is really stacked against uh, you know, the curious uh, or aggressive uh, people in that respect. Yeah. Um, I like the fact that Credor has so many layers of uh, reputation. There's, you know, the, the single article layer and that trickles back to the author and that trickles back to the platform of the institution. Um, are you seeing a lot of platform and institution and author rankings being shuffled a lot? Are you seeing up and coming sub stackers taking down Wall Street Journal and stuff like that? Yeah, we are. Um, uh, I don't have it in front of me right now, but if you if you went to creditor.com slash leaderboard, uh, I think you'd be surprised at a lot of authors and outlets that you've maybe never heard of, but that are right up there at the top of the leaderboard, uh, pushing, you know, more more well-known brand name institutions further down on the list. So yeah, there's some incredible publishers and journalists out there who are just giving their audiences exactly the, the kind of 
high quality news and reporting on a continued basis that they're looking for. And that shows through in the numbers and Credder doesn't put its hand on, you know, these rankings in any way. So we see all sorts of people and, and publishers pop up here. And sometimes I look at the leaderboard and I see somebody broke into the top 20 or something. And I'm like, I've never even heard of this outlet. That means Credder's doing its job. It's helping people find and celebrate publishers that are totally you know, not getting the recognition they deserve. And the reason that we're stuck with these mainstream outlets is because there's so much content and publishers out there. How in the hell are you gonna figure out who to go listen to outside of it? You're getting fed the mainstream. There's infinite amounts of content and publishers you know, it's it's a real challenge for an individual news consumer to take it on themselves to go find high quality sources for themselves. And so we really try to, you know, make that easy for people who want to finally step outside maybe that that echo chamber that they're in. Awesome. Do you have any rules of thumb or tips for individuals when it comes to making those kinds of explorations and decisions? Uh, as like for filtering uh, for news consumers themselves? Yeah, like if I'm if I'm sick of corporate media, but I don't know what to do about it, the, you know, leaving the the you know the visible spectrum of credibility and venturing out into chaos land. What do you have any advice for most people who maybe don't have all the time in the world to you know devote their lives to that? Yeah, I mean, this might sound self-serving, but it's what I do as yeah. a news consumer. Is I just check out the leaderboard. And if I see an outlet or an author that I've never heard of, I just go see what they're writing. And, uh, and you know, nine out of 10 times you find, you know, gold that you never would have found otherwise. So if, if you're real, you know, sensitive on time, well, that's why there's a leaderboard. It's, uh, it makes it really fast. You just, there's the list, look for a name you don't recognize and dive in. Sweet. I'm definitely gonna do that. Um, do you, do you get the feeling that Project Censored is, is going to be put out of a job by Credder? Are you going to, no. are your publishers, your <laughs> publishers going to cover so many, you know, incredible things that don't get the right coverage that they can? Check? No, no. Uh, there will always be 25 stories in a year that doesn't get the attention it deserves. Um, whether that's Jeffrey Epstein, UFOs, um, you know, the US, US war crimes abroad. Um, there's just so, so many stories that are also too complicated and complex and sometimes boring for, yeah. for it to become, you know, news on cable news, for example. So, so if you have like financial crimes, economic crimes, um, you know, something like Goldman Sachs, um, or sorry, not Goldman Sachs, um, Chase. Chase Bank was uh, found guilty of manipulating the gold market recently. Um, that's something that your average person is not going to hear about, but they were fined a billion dollars. But in the process of doing so over the last decade, they made hundreds of billions of dollars suppressing the price of gold. And so that's like, that's really interesting, important world news, but you're not going to hear about it. Or, or, you know, BlackRock buying up a lot of real estate and, and um, family homes as a, uh, as a financial asset for investment, but it price, you know, outbidding and pricing out actual families that would otherwise live in those homes. Um, that gets a little bit more airtime, but there's a lot of these kind of financial crimes and, uh, and manipulations of markets that uh, they're never going to be getting wide stream, you know, um, widespread airtime because it's people assume that the audience is dumb. And that's really what a lot of these issues that uh, come down to. It's easier to cover the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial and assume that your audience is dumb and fascinated with celebrity culture than to cover, uh, you know, some of these stickier, more nuanced, but probably way more affecting your life topics. And to some degree, I think news consumers do have a bit of blame in this because um, some will argue, well, the publishers are just giving us what we want and the algorithms are just giving you what you want. And obviously we're voting with our clicks and our eyes and our attention. And what we want is, you know, sensationalism. Uh, but I, I think it's 
that's not that's the job of entertainers is to give you what you want and i think yeah. journalism is supposed to hold to its own standard and is and the people inside of journalism just like doctors you know people who become doctors they have a certain moral or ethical belief in helping people even though they tend to work crazy hours and schedules and they you know you know work themselves to death to do it i think journalism is the same way so is teaching there are certain professions in society where you know you're not necessarily going to be appreciated or rewarded but you're doing it because you you understand the importance of the institution and that some some kind of check needs to exist there um, and uh, i think it's it's the journalist's job to stand up to their editorial teams and who want to clickbait their headline and and want to have them cover a certain topic instead of a more important topic, uh, but I, my goal, my hope is that something like Creditor will arm the journalist with a metric that they can use to go to their editorial and say, hey, whenever I write about X, I'm getting really great feedback from readers, and uh, and when I write about these sensational clickbaity types of topics, I get knocked by readers. And you know what? Yeah, you're paying me to do the work, but I have uh, a reputation of my own to protect. And if you don't let me do the journalism I want to do here, I'm going to take this reputation I built to Substack. Um, and so I think a combination of creditor plus Substack gives journalists what they need to uh, to stand up to the editorial or the advertising based financial incentives that are that are driving everything right now. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. Are there any crazy stories out there that you don't feel are getting enough coverage, uh, whether in corporate media or alternatives on creditors leaderboard? Um, one. So there's one. Uh, one topic that I'm really I spend a lot of time on space tourism. Uh, I spent a, a lot of time on on this particular industry. And I think it's, it's getting the attention, but it's getting a incredible misframing. Uh, so the framing right now is, oh, we got these three billionaires, Elon Musk, uh, Jeff Bezos, and um, Richard Branson, just three billionaires shooting off their big rockets into space. And it's like, they, they basically are constantly referring to it as a dick measuring contest. That's kind of the framing of it. But it totally discounts two things. It discounts that first, all new technology is expensive at first and prices come down over time to become more accessible to wider uh, wider audiences. That's true with everything. Um, and, and the second is it discounts the value in what I think is the most incredible worthwhile experience that a human can have, um, which is the overview effect, which if you're, you know, you're probably familiar with, but astronauts come home and uh, yeah, and being able to, they say that the experience of looking back on earth is the most incredible, life-changing, perspective altering, um, experience that it's for them it's more valuable than anything else they do in space or in their astronaut careers is the ability in that moment that first time that they look back on planet earth and they don't see you know the drawn out borders on the map they realize the fragility of the blue planet in the vast emptiness of space and they come back with a sense of oneness and a protectionism for planet earth that i think not only should we want the richest people in the world to go have this experience, to make new investments and come back less focused on personal material wealth and, and, and to, you know, if this is what it takes, if it takes shooting billionaires and millionaires up into space to uh, give them the sense of oneness that they've been missing as they've been chasing down material wealth, then great, you know, we can't, blast them with psychedelic mushrooms or anything, but you can send them off into space and let them have that experience. And I think it's probably very similar. So first, yes, I want the richest people in the world to all go up into space and look back on the planet because they're going to come back and we're going to be better for that. And then second is if we don't do that, I, my kids, you know, the next generations will not be able to go have this experience, which I think the more humans we get to blast off into space, look back on earth, understand how vulnerable we are, 
and how beautiful and miraculous it is that we exist on this, you know, spinning rocket ship through infinite space. Uh, we're so caught up in our daily lives of of running around, ch you know, chasing the next paycheck or the next little bit of um, recognition on social media and all this that if it takes going into zero gravity and looking back on earth to wake people up and we can wake a lot of people up by doing this, then yes, space tourism to me is quickly becoming one of the most important industries, experiences, phenomenons of our lifetime. And, uh, and I really don't think it's helpful to frame it as three billionaires, you know, just trying to show off and spend their money because the, the other you know, if I can keep going here, the other, the other thing that they say is, oh, you should spend that money at home. Um, why spend money to go to space? We should spend that money to solve problems here on Earth. Well, first off, so many of the problems we've solved and techno technological breakthroughs we've experienced here on Earth are because we had to design tools and technologies that were capable of taking us to space. We then benefit by being able to bring those technologies back to Earth and do really incredible things. You know, the NASA program, there's crazy long lists of things, you know, all the way from GPS to, uh, you know, Velcro uh, that were invented as requirements to go to space, but then get to come back home and be useful here on Earth. And again, I think that the these rich people going up into space, looking back on Earth, I find it very hard to believe that anyone can go through that experience unchanged and unchanged for the better. Uh, so yeah, if we're gonna get, you know, the concentration of wealth, uh, or, or if we want investments in things that protect Earth, then we need to change the minds of the people who are capable of making those investments. I like that. I think that's awesome. And just all amazing points that I didn't realize the overview effect was so universal. I thought it happened maybe to like a third of astronauts or something like that. But it's, no, it it's... Like it's yeah well not all astronauts actually i don't believe all astronauts actually have the chance to look back on earth because some of them are so busy some of them don't have the big window there there are certain missions that i think they don't even have a chance to really look back on earth but for all of them that do um they come back and and it's all they can talk about wow. yeah i think that's i think that's a great point that we should give the people with power that kind of uh, perspective uh, so that they use it differently. They're paying to advance technology that will ultimately benefit us on earth. And they're, and they're gonna come back and make totally different decisions about their wealth. Yeah. Well, I look forward to the price of space travel coming down to the point where it makes sense to send prisoners because those are those are some people that maybe we could rehabilitate in a, you know a day or two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'd be interesting. Yeah, not not to not to say anything you know morally bad about prisoners. I think they're not necessarily the worst people that we deal with. But uh, in terms of you know you're talking about rehabilitation power for oh yeah for in general yeah I think that's super cool. It's like almost like an induced religious experience without. It is. And, it is yeah, exactly yeah. that. Yeah. It, um, some people look to psychedelics for their religious, spiritual experience that um, that they maybe can't get otherwise. Um, and if you're not for drugs or drug culture, fine. This is a non-drug induced, non kind of dogmatic religious way of having a out of body, spiritual, religious type experience. Yeah, that's awesome. That seems just infinitely useful. Do you know of any other non-religious, non-drug, non-space ways of inducing this? I'm just, this seems like a good thing to have a list of. Yeah, there's, I know that there's, you know, with a lot of practice and training, there are breathing techniques and yoga techniques, um, but those are like less guaranteed. Um, right, you have to, you have to want it. Yeah, you have yeah, to, yeah, yeah, you have to really work at that. Um, yeah. Whereas with psychedelic drugs, for example, or getting shot up into space, you know, it's almost guaranteed you're going to feel something. So, yeah. and I think getting shot into space 
will generally be a positive and beautiful experience, whereas drugs can also show you things that are not pleasant. Yeah. Uh, or so I've heard. Yeah. 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 So long as everybody comes back safely from space I, and you know doesn't have a traumatic experience up there uh, because, you know, something goes wrong and they barely make it back. I, I, I think it's almost to a level where it's safe enough for everyone and repeatable enough that, uh, yeah, it's a win. It's a net win. And we need to stop treating this as such a negative. If you want to fear monger over AI or, you know, certain other issues, okay, maybe there's more justification there, but people getting to go to space, it doesn't make any sense to me. There's no negatives. Yeah. Speaking of fear mongering over AI, are there any particular issues like that that your unique vantage as a uh, credibility entrepreneur gives you that you know maybe other people need to know? Um, I'm not sure. And I've realized that you know we're a, a little constrained because as credibility entrepreneurs, we kind of have a, a, a responsibility to represent credibility. We can't too, sound too crazy, especially on other people's podcasts. Yeah. I can sound as crazy as I want, but you have to, you know, make the Rotten Tomatoes guy look good and, and, the, invest, and the investors look good and all that stuff. Yeah. I completely understand. Um, so it's a bit of a, a, a unique a unique conversation that, that we're in, in that respect, a unique dance that we have to do. And I totally respect that. It's true. Um, it's true. For a while, I thought um, that I shouldn't be visible at all. Like, I don't want to become the face of the company. I, I shouldn't share my thoughts and opinions. Um, you know, but as, at a certain point, it is the CEO's job to promote the business. And you can't really do one without the other. Yeah. And the vision. Like, you have to be the one saying, hey, we ought to all go do X. We got to carry the flag and yeah. wave it. Um, what has that looked like for you? Do you do a lot of public stuff, outreach, give speeches at you know conferences, anything like that? Uh, I've done speeches and panels and that kind of stuff at media literacy conferences and that kind of stuff. But um, for me, really, it's just the the Creditor podcast. I do have on a lot of interesting guests and and just like what we're doing here. You know, the first part of the conversation focuses on their project, what they're doing, but then it always tends to move into kind of uh, not necessarily more interesting, but more opinion based subjects. And and so but I but I enjoy that. I I think I, I'm basically confident enough in the evidence of what I talk about now that I don't talk about things I don't know about. I know about space tourism. I know about Bitcoin. I know about online news. Um, uh, I, I wish I knew more about the UFO UAP phenomenon, but I know enough yeah. to know that something is happening and I, I'm not afraid to face whatever is happening. And, and I hope we get more information, but I, I know that something's happening something that we can't explain um, and that that should have everybody wanting to spend more time on the topic. Yeah, hundred percent. Totally agree. Um, without getting, you know, into particular rabbit holes, obviously like conspiracy theorists and I count myself in that, not as a derogatory term, uh, occupy a large percentage of news consumers nowadays. Um, I, I suppose I expect the conspiracy theorizing voice to get louder over time in one way or another. Um, but also, yeah, is, is Creditor, how do you, how do you feel about that? Do you agree, disagree? Are you seeing that? Um, like what's, what's Creditor's general relationship to things that other platforms might write off on the basis of their content? Yeah, so um, first I'd say that uh, conspiracies do exist. Um, not, not every conspiracy theory that somebody has 
is in relation to a real conspiracy. And, and there's conspiracies that a lot of conspiracy theorists have probably never heard of or unaware of, but conspiracies do happen from time to time. Um, we know that. So the term conspiracy theorist has really gotten a negative rap. And, and it's actually, uh, if I remember correctly, this is like meta conspiracy theory here. The label conspiracy theorist itself, I believe was uh, termed by the CIA to discredit people who are looking into some of their programs. Um, so that's kind of double layer of conspiracy theory there because the label conspiracy theorist itself kind of has a conspiracy theory behind it. Um, as for how it relates to creditor, uh, I think our review process does a really good job of forcing somebody to not spout their theories and opinions and wants and needs, but really to, to just target critique of a piece of content. Um, and as for kind of whether or not it should be allowed on other platforms, I'm of the belief that yes, uh, because I think that if you, if your goal, if, if the justification, if we're going to give you know, a platform, the benefit of the doubt and say the justification, the intention behind limiting this kind of speech on a platform is because it is not necessarily evidence based or, or it's not wide held belief or um, or it's somehow dangerous. I think the much more dangerous thing to do is to force it underground. Um, in every situation, if there's people saying all sorts of craziness, those people believe that whether you let them say it and have other people engage with them and try to change their minds or not. And if you take it away from them, you do two things. You force it underground where nobody sees it and nobody can you know, participate in, in changing minds. And you give them a, I, I don't know if it's necessarily a victim mentality, but like a, like a, a injustice, complex. persecution, injustice complex, where it's like, yeah. we must be onto something because the powerful have, have, you know, zo zoomed in on us and they don't want us talking about it. We must have hit a nerve, um, which obviously is technically flawed logic, but, uh, but it, it is what these people t seem to take away as their feeling and the rationale. And then it's just bubbling under the surface and nobody knows about it until it, it you know, pops up its ugly head in some other way. So I'm of the belief that, like we said at the very beginning, the the solution to bad speech is more speech. Sunlight is the ultimate disinfectant. Um, ultimately, we're in a society where arguments and idea, like it's it's a marketplace of ideas. And if some people bring some, you know, cuckoo ideas to the forefront, you have to trust the market. And this is ultimately the concept of what you're doing and what, our, what we're doing at Credit too, is like, you can't decide for the marketplace uh, regarding the marketplace of ideas. You can't decide, you can't put your fingers on the scale. You either trust the marketplace or you don't trust society to solve problems and talk through things and, and you don't believe in the power of argument. And, and so if you believe in the marketplace of ideas, you need to, and you're doing this and we're doing this, create a tool or create a marketplace where those ideas can uh, battle it out and, uh, and everything can be seen uh, by all who are on looking. 100%, couldn't agree more, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I think that was beautifully, beautifully said. Um, I'm curious about um, on the like, regarding conspiracy theories i've often i've often come out just incredibly in favor i've said things like conspiracy theories are basically vitamins they force you to reconsider new things instead of telling other people to like i've and i i believe that but i think it's a little too unbridled because at the same time there are people who uh you know get attached to a particular rabbit hole go down it it redefines their whole life it costs them tons of relationships um that's not a good that's 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 not healthy. Like whether you're, yeah, that's that's not healthy. And I'm I'm trying to figure out like what the right way to temper uh, the the inevitable need to deal with a wide variety of perspectives. And I don't just mean that like Democrat Republican. I mean that like every kind of crazy you know that that 
there is, or at least crazy sounding. Yeah. I'm wondering like how you personally deal with that or how you'd recommend people deal with that. So I have a, th I have a theory on this. Um, it's, it's by no means necessarily evidence-based, although there might be evidence out there. I, I can't say that I've spent the time uh, on it, but I have this theory that the people who you, you're kind of referring to there where you lose them down a rabbit hole so deep, so crazy that they, it alienates them from their friends and family. You know, they, they can't sleep. They, they start doing all sorts of crazy stuff in, in their commitment to this one thing. To me, I think of those people as like, we were, and this is again, not, it's not nice, but we were going to lose that person to something. They were going to eat too much pizza and drive themselves crazy that way. They were going to watch too much TV and never leave the house and drive themselves crazy that way. I think there are some people who have a problem of discipline and self-control and just go too far, too focused uh, down a certain rabbit hole, but I don't necessarily blame the rabbit hole. I just feel like that's the thing that got to them. You know, it's like this drug would have gotten to them. This piece of information could have gotten to them. Uh, this experience could have gotten to them. There's certain people who just were unfortunately destined to fall down a crack and hopefully they can recover from it. Um, but there's such a wide range of experience as humans that there's bound to be people that you're going to lose to any certain thing. You know, you can say conspiracy theories are a bad thing because some people lose themselves in them, but there's lots of people losing themselves to diet Coke. There's lots of people losing themselves to reality TV. Um, there's a lot of things that people can go too far down the path on. And to me, it's like reality TV got to that person before X, Y, or Z. And, and so um, it's not a great thought because it's almost like fatalist to a certain degree. Um, but I, I do think that some people's upbringings, you know, mental faculties, biological or chemical makeup of the brain causes them to become very addicted. And, uh, and I think people can get addicted to almost anything in society. And, and it's not necessarily the things, the thing is to blame, you know, Diet Coke isn't necessarily bad, if people can approach it within reason. And, you know, it's not a substitute for water. TV isn't necessarily bad. Reality TV even isn't necessarily bad. I just think a lot of people, um, these are easy paths to lose themselves to because there's nobody saying, stop, you've had enough. There's, there's an interest in basically pushing them as far down the rabbit hole as they can. Yeah, I really, I, I actually like that framing a lot, the sort of addictiveness framing. I think there are addictive personalities. I mean, a lot of yeah. people have them. Yeah. And um, myself included at times, like, have you heard of the rat park experiment? No, I don't think there so. Was, I think this will this will underscore your point. The rat park experiment was uh, a study of, about addiction where they had uh, rats that were put in two different cages. And one cage was, you know, kind of crap. It, you know, it just didn't, it wasn't very comfortable. It had some of the basics of, you know, rat life. It was just very kind of stripped down and Spartan. The other cage had like flowing water in it and it had mates of male and female and it had plants and it had everything that a rat could possibly need to be fulfilled in its natural kind of state. Mm -hmm. And with both cages, they gave like a, like a, cocaine smoothie drip or something and the rats in the deprived spartan cage were just hitting the cocaine all the time and the ones in the healthy cage would try the cocaine and then not really come back to it they would lose interest and the you know the general interpretation of this is that uh addictions rush in to fill a void where an essential need is not being met that it's not the substance itself, but the condition of lacking something essential that paves the way for addictions to form. And if, if conspiracy theories can meet some kind of 
unmet emotional or psychological need that people have, it would make sense that it doesn't inherently come from the information, but from a vulnerability in the person. Yeah, I believe, I believe exactly that. Yeah, I think that person was going to fall down some crack and the conspiracy theory got to them before something else. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, what does that mean about the general safety of conspiracy theories as a topic? Like, would you therefore recommend everyone read a bunch of them? Because if they're vulnerable, they'll succumb to something anyway? Like, huh. <laughs> uh, almost like uh, there should be a retreat where you can, under supervision and guidance, like learn about all the different conspiracy theories out there. That could be interesting. Yeah, um, well, like, the, the, yeah, I, I mean, that's not what I had in mind, but that's, that is interesting. Yeah, I, I do think people should be aware of what they are, um, what some of the main conspiracy theories are. And I think most people are uh, at least aware. I don't think they've looked into it, you know, whether it's JFK assassination, um, uh, the moon landing, you know, 9-11 um, as an inside job. You know, there's a lot of mainstream conspiracy theories. And then there's, you know, your, your lesser known to the mainstream conspiracy theories. I think yeah. people should at least look into the mainstream ones um, because I do think that ultimately what a conspiracy theory tends to be is it, it tends to be a questioning of the official government narrative um, because I'm, I'm not, it's not always the case, but most conspiracy theories revolve around distrusting the government uh, or, or come back to the government in some way. Uh, obviously, there are corporate conspiracies as well, but uh, it almost always seems to be uh, to do with the government. And, uh, and I do think it's very healthy to question our government. Um, I think it's actually the most patriotic thing that a citizen can do is question uh, their government, so long as the questioning is in the hopes of, you know, um, moving the country in a more healthy, positive direction. I, I think it's, uh, there's this attitude out there amongst the so-called patriots in the United States that, you know, America's the best, America's great, we're perfect, we're the exceptional ones. Um, and I think that that is the least patriotic stance you can take because you're basically saying we have no room to improve and that we shouldn't be trying to be getting even better. Um, so yeah, I, I think patriotism is questioning your government. And I think conspiracy theories typically are an experiment uh, in questioning your government on a specific story. Um, and, you know, a lot of conspiracy theories have later been found out to be true. So it's not the case that just because the information is opaque right now that this, you know, your crazy conspiracy theory uncle or cousin won't end up being right. And, and you might want to write them off because you think, whatever, it doesn't matter. I'll find out someday whether he's right or not. Um, but uh the infor a lot of the information is out there. I think a lot of the the distrust of government comes from a lack of sharing information as well. I think the government could probably both kill and confirm a lot of conspiracy theories in one fell swoop if they just released a lot of, a lot of information that probably should already be in the public domain. Um, and this is another trend that Project Censored was focused on is, is more and more things that did not originally deserve the title of classified information are becoming classified. Basically anything that makes the government look bad becomes classified information. It's no longer based on kind of a, a prerequisite of does it put, you know, US military personnel lives at, uh, at a risk or does it provide uh, strategic information about something that we don't want to get out there everything is being classified now just because it makes certain individuals or, or the government programs as a whole look bad. And so they're being classified. And that's, uh, that just gets us further and further away from making the adjustments we need to get the US government and, uh, and its alignment with 
the voters and taxpayers. Uh, it's just pushing us further and further away. It's the same downward spiral that I see in news. Yeah, and that makes perfect sense. And it seems like you know there's this precarious position now where threats to faith in the government is considered national security now because if if the faith is insufficient if the trust is insufficient um then there's you know that's that's a real vulnerability and like a, seem, perhaps a lot of international you know power struggles are fought on the basis of faith on the basis of of pr image management and things like that um sweet yeah is there anything that you feel i should have asked you in this time not really i i did hear one of your previous interviews you asked the like what are you long on what are you short on what is sure. underappreciated i kind yeah. of already touched on on some of it um but i did think about my answers to those questions uh so i guess i'll, I'll just pose that to myself no for, thank you beautiful the end thank here you. The underappreciated one is space tourism for all the reasons that I gave. I think it's totally maligned for dumb, short-sighted reasons right now. So that's underappreciated. Um, the topic I'm most long on or, or idea I'm most long on, and of course, none of this is financial advice, but Bitcoin, uh, I believe, is the longest anyone can ever be long on anything because it basically is a is is a tool that has no time component to it uh, it is theoretically infinite and so if i am long on this technology and this this better form of money um as i am then i'm like technically longer on bitcoin than you can be long on anything so uh that's that and then as for what I'm short on, and I don't pretend to be too well versed, uh, but I am short on the concepts, or not necessarily the concepts, but the reality of aging and death. I do think that these are solvable biological problems. I'm not saying that the world will be better when we live forever and we stop aging. I think that's going to create a lot of problems because in many ways, society evolves, unfortunately through the death of the older generation, making way for younger ideas um, uh, and younger people. So I'm not sure that living forever will be good for the species, um, but I do believe that aging and then ultimately death are solvable problems that are being treated as solvable problems uh, for maybe the first time ever and getting the investment and the research uh, and the kind of entrepreneurial approach that they deserve. And, and I, I do think that you're in my lifetime. Maybe we won't solve death, but I actually, you know, I do feel confident that we're going to solve aging in our lifetime um, with things like CRISPR technology for gene editing. Um, that's huge. So I'm really bullish on that. And then, uh, and then if you wanted to say that life is just your consciousness, I could theoretically see humans living forever in a cyborg body where you're no longer vulnerable to heart disease, lung disease, prostate cancer, whatever, because they've basically put your brain in a, uh, in a robotic body parts that move based on your brain waves and have replaceable parts that are not at risk of deteriorating because of cell degeneration. Um, and if you wanted to go even, if you don't, if you think that there's a step further than that, which I do think there is, there's the concept of being able to download your consciousness. So maybe the physical brain isn't even a necessary, uh, you know, organ to have in that equation. So uh, I think aging and death are solvable problems. Um, I think Bitcoin is, it, it like gets me out of bed some mornings. Uh, it, it is the hope that, uh, that I think was very much needed in today's uh, concentrated wealth and, and, you know, corrupted and totally manipulated markets. And, uh, and I, I'm super long on the overview effect. And I think 
people who say, I don't want to go to space, I think that they haven't done the homework. And I think, uh, I think it's for everyone. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I want to ask a little bit more about Bitcoin after this answer of yours. Sure. Um, I loved your, you know, kind of philosophical lens of, you know, if you're long Bitcoin, you're longer than you can be on anything else. Yeah. I've never heard that before. It's really cool. Um, I don't, I don't think I've heard it before either. Actually, I, it came to me last night when I was looking at that question. I was like, I guess I'm long Bitcoin. And then I was like, how long can you be on Bitcoin? Well, technically you can be infinitely long on Bitcoin. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. And then if you, if you leverage that, are you double infinite? 36 yeah. infinite? There are different size infinities. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Infinity over 21 million too. So there we go. Um, does, do you or Credit have plans to get involved in the Bitcoin or crypto universe at some point in the future? That's a great question. Um, I don't, I, I want Credit to someday benefit from blockchain and the incentive mechanisms of, of basically creating an incentive for reviewer participation. I think that would be great. I think it would be a great way of, of basically sharing in the wealth that is created from the reviewer contributions. Um, uh, to some degree, I think it's a, it's a defensive mechanism because I could see a blockchain, you know, coin incentivized version of Credor emerging. And so if I want Credor to remain relevant, I do think to some degree it's necessary. Um, but I do worry about the level of iteration that we can do when we make a move like that. I think it becomes a lot harder to make changes um, things become a little bit more fixed. Um, and I, I don't think we have nailed everything yet. When I, I think if we feel like, wow, we've got it, and this day will probably never come, but if it did come where we're like, there's nothing to add, nothing else to do, I would love to look at porting it over to a blockchain and creating uh, rewards for the reviewers, maybe rewards for the publishers who are, are getting rated positively, um, some kind of a, a financial incentive to combat the financial incentive of, of advertising and clickbait that we're up against. Um, so that would be cool. As for Bitcoin, I've thought in the past about putting Bitcoin on our balance sheet. Um, we haven't done it, um, not to say we won't ever, um, so right now, crypto and Bitcoin are, are very much more in my own personal life than they are for Credor. Totally. That makes sense. Um, one last thing. Are there any like uh, commentators or media theorists or anybody on Twitter or Substack or any individuals out there who you feel are just nailing exactly what you think people need to hear? From a Bitcoin standpoint, in particular? No, no. Oh, no. I'm sorry. Just in general. Just in general. As a, as someone who's working on, you know, uh, rejuvenating uh, journalism and public knowledge in general, who who out there, it, big or small, do you think is just doing an absolute killer job? Because I know I keep, you know, seeing people who go make me think, damn, I wish I had said that. That is those these guys are complete completely on the ball. Yeah. I'm trying to quickly pull up my Twitter right here. Uh, yeah. This is hard. That's hard. Um, like even if even if even if they're only right maybe twenty percent of, of the time, maybe that twenty percent is still worth it. Like I'm not saying they're always right, but like who's who's a really valuable, low hanging fruit of a voice? Ah. <sighs> I don't love a lot of the commentators in the journalism space. I think they're either usually too focused on the journalist standpoint or too focused on the news consumer standpoint. And they're not seeing that there's different incentives and, and different roles that each play. Sure. But um, what about private citizens? I'm like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not actually expecting it to. Yeah, come from no, I know. Journalism. I know. I'm, I, I'm trying to think, I'm sorry. I, I, don't know that there's anyone coming to mind for that. I, I'd almost, I'd have plenty of names for you in the Bitcoin Twitter space. 
Uh, Bring that on then. That's right. absolutely. Let me valid. give you that sure. because then I can actually okay. provide some value because otherwise I'm just going to come up with something that I don't fully necessarily back. Um, cool. No problem. So there's your Michael Saylors of the world, your Robert Breed loves. Love him. Um, Naval, Chamath Palihapitiya. Basically, the All In podcast is killer content, absolutely crucial um, content. Um, Lynn Alden. Um, yeah, those would be some of my go-tos in the Bitcoin space. And, and my opinion is that Bitcoin touches everything. So it touches technology, energy, entrepreneurship, capitalism, markets. So, uh, the psychology in, incentives, it touches everything in my opinion. Um, I think it's unique in that way. So uh, I don't know that that's, yeah, it's not necessarily relevant to journalism or Credder, but um, you can always follow me and Credder for you know information on, uh, we, we're always sharing thoughts and takes and what we're seeing on the platform, uh, but I can't, it's hard for me to pick anyone else outside of that in the journalism world. That's, that's totally fine. Maybe I'm just, uh, you know, putting something, putting it in a, do you, do you have, might not be there. do you have some people in the kind of journalism or credibility space? Uh, I guess I would say the CEO of trust pilot. Um, I'm forgetting his name right now, but he really puts out some great ways, uh, some great copywriting, some great ways of framing trust pilot in a way that is, you know, very easy for us to kind of mimic. Yeah. Um, no, in the in the credibility space, it's hard because it's a small it's a small niche. Like epistemology tech hasn't even really been named yet, but yeah. it's going to be so important. Um, I really like Connor White Sullivan, the founder of Rome. Uh, we've talked about stuff, and you know, I I love. I think he's you know made a breakthrough in how we think about keeping track of information and just building a product that's a better metaphor for how our brains actually work and how we actually do that. Hmm. And I'm just a big fan of like metaphor product fit. What's the game we're really playing and is the product we're currently using or the system we're currently using well aligned to help us win at that game. Hmm. And I think a lot of big breakthroughs come like at the metaphor level first. Are we uh, trying to find certainty about things? If we're not, why are we pretending we are? Is that even a possibility? Right. Um, and you know those those kinds of innovations that help kind of build new assumptions into the users without the users having to really think about it. It just works better, and they don't have to know why. Um, that kind of stuff gets me really excited. So um, I'm I'm a fan of uh, him and Roman and people who just kind of work like that. Yeah, um, and and I read yeah. your your blog post um, about the the metaphor of facts i believe um and i think you and i are pretty much in agreement in that neither of our platforms is trying to identify truth or fact um and that it's not necessarily something you can ever wrap your hands around totally totally and you know there there are probably um just better ways to solve the problem than than coercing certainty out of a universe that doesn't want to give it to you. Right. Like, I think um, you can measure trust and by definition, therefore credibility, because credibility yeah. is essentially just trust over time. Um, so I think you can measure trust, but I don't think you can measure truth or measure fact. Yeah, yeah. And, and trust, is, trust is what allows truth to, right. to propagate. It's our proxy. So, yeah, yeah, it's our yeah. shortcut to d decide whether we should listen to someone's truth. Yeah. And without that, what good is the truth? Right. Exactly. You can have, if truth happens in a forest and there's nobody there to trust them, you know. Right. Or <laughs> oh, yeah. there's only conspiracy theorists. So <laughs> yeah. no one's going to listen to them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. Awesome. Uh, well, I've enjoyed this a lot. I really appreciate it. I'm going to check out uh, the credit leaderboard and explore and, you know, see if I can get my hands dirty a little bit. Great. Thank you, man. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, do you want to do a last second drop of like links, Twitter profiles, usernames, et cetera? 
Uh, sure. So creditor.com is the open news review platform spelled C-R-E-D-D-E-R. Um, if you're a business that might benefit or, or is just interested in learning more about our database and how it can be used, um, that's enterprise.creditor.com. Um, follow me on Twitter at Chase Palmieri, and uh, you can follow Creditor at Creditor App. Uh, on Twitter. And then there's the Creditor Podcast, which we'll have to get Mike on to return the favor uh, sometime soon. And maybe when you have some some new feature or product you want to promote, or even tomorrow, if you want, later today, we could probably knock one out. But uh, but uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. And uh, please check out Creditor. Uh, we're the Rotten Tomatoes for news. <laughs> I, I love it. It's one of my favorite taglines in the space. Awesome, man. Thanks so much. And I'm totally going to take you up on that because we do have some new things coming up. So great. Don't, Definitely. I hope you're not kidding about tomorrow because I might make it happen. Let's do it. Love it. All right. All right. Thanks, Thanks so much, Mike. Man. Thank you. You got it. And then I pause.